descriptive study to better understand what family navigation services are being delivered at each of the 14 ATN sites. Katrina Kubitschek is a program manager for the Division of Research on Children, Youth, and Families at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and Dr. Kipke is Professor of Pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and the Principal Investigator for the ATN site at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. So we're really pleased today to have both Katrina um, and Michelle here today to share the results with us. Okay, thank you, Donna, um, and thank you, folks, for, for joining us today. Um, I am really excited to share these preliminary findings from the study that we are wrapping up, and uh, we are actually also moving into the next phase, so I think this is great timing to, to share the results from this particular study. So I can go to the next slide. So this particular study, um, for those that are not aware, as a you know part the ASA TN has really wanted to better understand the family navigation services that are being delivered across their sites. In the more recent iterations of the grant proposals, each site was required to um, provide some kind of family navigation service, and knowing that there weren't a lot of parameters provided in that, and when that was uh, decided, the ASA team really wanted to understand what family navigation looks like across the sites to really understand the variability. So they formed a work group comprised, comprised of staff, parents, and researchers. And over the last about, I'd say, 18 months, um, we have been meeting and discussing what this study will look like and then sitting down and um, actually tackling the data collection process, which I'll go, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but first of all, just kind of thinking about what is family navigation, and there's a lot of definitions about what this may be, and it's a model that's used quite frequently for families that are dealing with chronic or other complex health issues such as cancer. It has shown to be a very um, helpful resource for families to link them into care to manage a complicated or complex health issue and to really help parents stay on top and become empowered to handle their child's health issues. And a definition that we put here, which is certainly not the um, the only definition, but a definition that I thought captured a lot of what we heard from various folks as we conducted this study was that a patient navigator um, can be a community health worker, a lay health advisor, a social worker, a nurse, etc. The individuals help community members and our clients and patients navigate through the healthcare system from prevention through end of life. Some have gone through extensive training and are paid, while others have been trained but work on a volunteer basis. So. This really encompasses and helps to identify that a family navigator can be almost anyone. Um, and what they do to help patients navigate the healthcare system is certainly going to depend upon the jurisdiction in which they are housed, the needs of the families that they're servicing, and the health condition that they're, they're handling. So there are many different definitions, but I think this kind of really touches on the fact that it, it can be any number of things. So the next slide, just to kind of briefly, this is the uh, Family Navigation Study Work Group. Um, so we had members of the leadership from the network, um, researchers at some of the different sites, staff from ASHTN, as well as parents that were represented on this particular work group. And um, they have been a tremendous help um, to shape this study and to recommend next steps and think about what this all means. And I'm hoping that folks today in the audience can contribute to that as well. Next. Okay. <coughs> so just to kind of quickly discuss the methods, I think one thing that is a little unique about this particular study is that we did take a mixed methods perspective with this. Um, so we tried to make sure that we were outreaching to all the different stakeholders as well as thinking about the best way to reach those different stakeholders. So our first step um, was we sent a survey to all of the ATN family navigators. 
And we asked each of the sites, while we know that all the sites have more than one person in this role, to really have just a single survey come back from each site. That way that we could easily um, analyze and understand what's going on at the different sites rather than having three surveys from one site, one from another. It just kind of made it easier to, to handle. So we got 13 surveys back. One site at the time did not have a family navigator in place. It was one of the newer, newly funded sites. So we had almost full participation in the survey. Um, and we initially looked at those results, and some of them I'll present today, but after looking at that the survey, we saw that there was some additional information that we really wanted to understand and something that couldn't necessarily be captured in just a survey um, that required more qualitative, contextual information. So we also um, completed three online or virtual focus groups with family navigators from across the network, and that was a total of 26 navigators participated in those three focus groups. Um, so we had multiple representation from each of the sites, and this was an opportunity for sites, for those who didn't respond to the survey, to also participate in the focus groups. Um, the online focus groups, this is the first time I had conducted focus groups like this, and we did have our share of technical difficulties. I think we, I learned a lot personally on how to conduct these in the future. Um, but it was a really unique way to be able to reach out to people across the country and really get um, some good information and discussion about what we had learned. And again, I will be sharing some of those results with you as well. And then we also did a survey of the principal investigators at each site or someone that they designated to respond for them. That was a relatively brief survey just to kind of verify information that we got from the navigators, but then also to get information about the evaluation and other activities going on. And then we also did three virtual focus groups with parents. Um, that was a total of 12 parents participated in these focus groups. And this was, I think, you know, a really important audience to engage because they are the recipients of the Family Navigation Services so they can really help us understand what the needs of families are, how to make those, how to best support those needs and how to best support families. So we took all these different perspectives and different methods and we triangulated these results to provide a current State of the Union of Family Navigation. Um, and really that State of the Union we wanted to look at one, how are sites defining family navigation? Um, we know that there are different ways of conducting family navigation, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, but really understanding what that means at each of the sites. And then what does family navigation look like on, on the ground? And we needed to have this kind of initial understanding of the services so that we could in our next steps do a prospective study to really look at what kinds of outcomes can family navigation best support and um, what are the benefits to family navigation. So we really needed to understand what it looks like before we could take that next step. The next slide. Okay, so now getting into some of the results. So in the survey we asked the family navigators a number of questions about demographics. Um, to get a sense of who they are. Um, on average, the family navigators have been in the role as a family navigator for more than three years. Um, but there was a range uh, in that. There was one individual who was very new to family navigation. They had been there just a couple months. And then we had someone who had been doing this for more than 10 years. So there was certainly a range of experience um, as a family navigator. Almost all of them, except there was two, I believe, that were not, but were master's level individuals that were either master's in education or social work or, or nursing or something similar. Um, they were mostly white, Caucasian, monolingual, English-speaking females. Um, and one thing that we um, thought about almost immediately is to what extent this may prevent present linguistic barriers at sites. If this is not necessarily the population that's being served, how are people really getting around some of the issues um, to best help families? <coughs> and in some of the focus groups we found 
you know, all the sites offer interpretation services at least through phone translators. Some of them had individuals that were on site that could help with this, but at minimum they had phone translators that were available to help with translation. But navigators still report that that can be problematic. Um, and this is a quote from one of them saying, you know, at times it is clear the interpreter is not relaying information correctly and parents are more confused. So this really does speak to some quality issues about the service provision and making sure that parents of diverse communities are able to receive uh, services that meet their needs and are um, understandable for them. And um, Family Navigator certainly felt that that was an area that that could be improved upon. Um, parents and navigators both in the different focus groups expressed that, you know, in an ideal world, it would be best to have a nav navigator that looks like the family. Um, but they recognize that's not always possible, especially in communities that are serving very diverse families. So the suggestion of pairing families with other parents is also an option. Um, and Parents in particular felt this was really important because parents can be an amazing support system for other parents because um, they've gone through many of the same challenges, they understand what families are going through, and they can be more relatable. Um, some parents on the focus group said that you know they have asked people who are serving them for their child, do you have a child with autism? And when the person doesn't, they feel like they may not fully understand the needs of the family. So they felt that you know, this was an option when uh, you cannot pair a navigator with a family um, based on their diversity. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is just a, a wordle, so a word cloud. Um, one of the questions that we asked was to define family navigation. And as I mentioned earlier, each of the sites has a different way of providing the services, which I'll talk about. But these are some of the words that came up most often as far as what family navigation means. And the larger the word, the more often it was said um, during the focus groups. So support, advocacy, empowering, meeting families' needs, providing referrals and access to care, guiding families, helping them understand, um, coordinating services, connecting families, all of these things were very important and were the types of things that we heard over and over again that you know, family navigation is there to support the families. They are there to meet their needs and families have a diverse array of needs based on their child's diagnosis and also just where the family is at um, in and of themselves. If they have other children, if they have other children with other health conditions, if the parents themselves have some kind of health condition, um, all of that's going to change. Um, so family navigators felt that because there's no cookie cutter approach, it should be very goal driven, which is another word um, or phrase that is um, was emphasized quite a bit to develop plans to meet the families where they're at um, and provide the support and connections that they need. Have Next slide. Okay. So we did learn as far as what the family navigation services look like at the ASATN, um, we found that each site has at least two people in the role. Um, some sites said that everyone in our clinic is part of the family navigation model meaning that they felt that the providers, the receptionists, um, admin assistant, whomever was in the office, all played a role in the family navigation. Um, we also had uh, one or two sites that were contracting with an outside agency, and that outside agency was, the, uh, was actually providing the family navigation. And in that instance, the outside agency um, included professional level individuals, but then also could refer parents to other parents as well. Um, there were also several sites that were utilizing social workers, um, and those social workers were on a rotating basis on different clinic days. Um, also nurses were oftentimes used in this way. And um, some had actual dedicated staff that were defined as a family navigator. Um, 
we did find that there were no volunteers in this particular role, which I think was surprising to many of us, um, kind of going back to that original definition that I put up in the beginning. It did emphasize that it doesn't have to be a paid person. It could be a volunteer, but in the, uh, within the network, all of them are um, paid in one way or another. Okay. Next slide. Um, one of the most interesting, I think, discussions, the most robust discussions that we had during the focus groups with both parents and the family navigators themselves was this idea of, similar to the volunteer model, whether a professional or a paraprofessional um, is the best option for this type of work. And some of the key results um, coming from these discussions are, are laid out here. Um, both parents and the family navigators felt that paraprofessionals or other parents have a personal knowledge and empathy that they can bring to the table. Um, and that could be really important for a parent that is going through um, grief and grieving for their child or trying to come to terms with the diagnosis, that personal empathy can be very important. Um, but both parents and navigators said that that can also cloud perspectives. Um, that parents may be drawing upon their own experiences um, solely and not looking at the bigger picture and oftentimes bringing their perspectives and their solutions to the parent. So that boundary that professionals um, are trained to keep may not be as clear when you have a paraprofessional or parent in this role. Um, they also felt that parents may have challenges in intervening with agencies directly. Um, oftentimes, if a parent has had a challenging experience working with a particular agency or with a school district, they may bring that to the table. Um, and that might be difficult to handle um, referrals and other um, services with those same providers. So again, that boundary sometimes can get blurred. Um, Parents may also have limited clinical ex expertise and may not be able to provide the breadth of referrals um, that are necessary that a social worker or nurse could um, identify more easily. And then some uh, family navigators felt that there also could be some liability issues with having a parent in this role. Um, and depending upon the clinic setting, the hospital, or other um, organizational issues, that could be um, a real barrier to bringing a parent um, into this role. Um, similarly, as I've already mentioned, um, understanding boundaries and their limited perspectives um, can make having a parent in this role a little challenging. And then finally, some agents, agencies actually do require referrals from a licensed provider. So a parent would not necessarily be able to make all the referrals necessary. So because of that, many and, um, of our uh, sites have opted to have the professional models for, um, for a number of these reasons. Um, both parents and family navigators agreed after these robust discussions that, you know, might actually be best to have a hybrid model where you have a professional paired with a parent or other or similar paraprofessional. They can provide different perspectives for this family. Social workers could provide resources and coordination and parents could provide understanding and empathy. So this seemed to be the model that almost everyone agreed would be in an ideal world, this is what you would want to pair the two together. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is um, results coming from the Family Navigator Survey. So we asked the navigators what their responsibilities are at the site, knowing that they probably wear a couple different hats at least. And we see that, of course, 100% uh, all of them are involved in family navigation. Um, a little over half are involved in clinical care or clinical operations to some extent. Um, a fairly large proportion are involved in community outreach, and then smaller portions are involved in the actual administration of the HDN grant, um, data collection, or data management. So most of them are doing something in addition to the family navigation, so it's not their sole responsibility. Um, next slide. Okay. 
Um, and then we have what types of services are provided by the ASATN. So these are what, when you actually are talking about family navigation, what does that mean? <coughs> and for most of them, um, community referrals are the most common. Everyone is doing community referrals of some kind. Almost everyone is conducting some kind of patient or family education. Um, and they were talking that, um, especially within school settings, um, this is a place where they are providing a lot of education and referrals is for um, parents navigating IEPs or other issues within their school districts. Um, they did, we did find that most of the autism, uh, or the family navigators rather, were working relatively closely with educational liaisons um, at the different school districts to help with this um, because the family navigators were not necessarily up to date on all of the educational laws, especially navigators that are working in more than one state, which I'll, I'll mention in a little bit as well. Um, so they also are doing a lot of visit follow-up, um, case management, and then this other category, which includes crisis intervention, um, safety assessments, um, psychosocial concerns, emotional support for parents and respite, um, things like that. So um, referrals and education seem to be um, like the bread and butter of most of the family navigators. And many of them mentioned, well, it's almost two-thirds of them are saying they were doing case management. Many of them in the focus groups also mentioned that this was really a need. Um, ongoing case management for families is something that they felt was a need and they are not always able to provide. Okay, um, next slide. Okay. Um, so in the survey for both the family navigators and the principal investigators, we've asked about training that was provided to the navigators. Um, to specifically to inform their responsibilities as the navigator. And we found that there are some very limited training opportunities um, as reported by both the navigators and the PIs. Um, several family navigators mentioned participating in webinars such as this um, when they were applicable to their work, um, finding trainings in their communities about um, different community resources were also common. Um, trainings about educational systems were also mentioned. Many of the respondents felt that because they were coming with a professional background, such as a social worker, um, as a nurse, that that did provide them a really strong foundation for this kind of work. Um, so they didn't feel that they were necessarily missing out on, a, lo on a, a lot of training opportunities, but they did identify a number of things that they thought would be important. And one of the most common, and um, within one of the focus groups in particular, this was discussed at length, is re um, really needing more cultural competency training. Cultural competency specifically in dealing with children with special needs. Um, they felt that there was a lot of barriers to serving different communities. Um, one navigator in particular talked about serving a large Arabic population, and within that community, there were a lot of taboos and stigma attached to a diagnosis of autism or other developmental delay. Um, we've seen the same thing here in Los Angeles. We did uh, a series of focus groups um, with um, Latino and African American families, and we did one focus group specifically with uh, Ethiopian families and found the same thing within that community that um, Boys in particular that are diagnosed with autism is a, it brings a lot of shame to the family because the son is the king or the prince of the family and the family mourns um, his potential with this type of diagnosis. So really understanding um, and navigating some of these cultural beliefs uh, and values was needed. Um, crisis intervention was also mentioned as a need, um, specifically around violence or um, children that uh, have run away or elopement. Transitioning to adulthood um, also mentioned as something that they, many navigators feel they could use additional help with. Empathy training, educational laws, um, state-specific. As I mentioned before, um, several of the sites 
mentioned that they have families that are coming across state lines, um, and that's very common. And so being up to date on the different educational laws in each state can be very challenging, and um, making sure that all they are up to date on everything is um, particularly difficult. So more information on that. Motivational interviewing was mentioned. Um, more information on the latest research. And then just more training on leadership and advocacy work. Next. OK, so this is an area that um, we saw some of the greatest variability is actually how families are referred to and served by family navigation. And this is where we get to a lot of variability. Um, we found that there's a lot of different routes to getting to the family navigation services. Um, sometimes um, you need a provider referral to the family navigator themselves. Um, this could be a live handshake where the provider actually brings the family over to the family navigator, introduces them, and um, the navigator then either sits down immediately with the family or makes an appointment to follow up with them to assess their needs. Um, other sites, the providers will simply send an email to the navigator with the family's information, asking them to follow up. Um, the timing of these referrals can be particularly challenging. Um, Family navigators and parents both felt that sometimes parents, it depends on the parent, sometimes they are immediately ready to, to jump in and take charge of their child's health plan and to really just um, empower to make those changes. Other times parents need some time to handle the diagnosis, come to terms with it, um, help the rest of their family understand it. So, that immediate referral may not always work. It may need be that you need to follow up with them in two or three weeks and see where the family is at. Um, some sites provide contact information um, for the navigator, so when a family is meeting the provider, they're handed a card or some other type of information with the name of the family navigator and her, his or her information saying if you need any help, Here's someone that you can reach out to. So a little bit more passive way rather than a, a handshake. There's also a couple sites that use warm lines where community members are able to call in directly to the clinic and ask for assistance and that they get a hold of the navigator that way. Um, and there's one site that was unique in that they said they sat in the waiting room in the clinic, and this is a quote from one of them that said, you know, we approach everyone, they have no choice but to notice us because we're sitting right there. So um, that was a very proactive way and also to ensure that each family was um, getting access to the navigators in that way. Um, so what this ends up looking like is there's some, some sites are giving that contact information in a very proactive way to every single person that walks through. Some um, providers are triaging that and deciding who could best benefit from the family navigation services and providing the referral that way. Some sites are leaving it up to the parents to actually follow up with the navigator themselves. So here you get a lot of variability about not only how families are accessing it, but who is actually targeted. Um, families and our parents, rather, and the navigators themselves felt that the ideal would be a much more proactive approach through a handshake, a phone call, or follow-up calls. And those follow-up calls were really important because, again, not every family is going to be ready to jump in and start working on their child's plan immediately after receiving the diagnosis. Some parents need time. So this is an area where we saw, again, some of the greatest variability, and it really is an important area to look at um, because it does determine who is actually getting access or um, the greatest access to these services. Okay, um, next slide. Okay. So we also asked both families and navigators themselves what the family needs are. Um, and this was in a survey as well as we did some in the focus group as well. Most commonly, community referrals. Um, and this was similar to access to services, the second bullet here. And this was really important um, 
one, because sometimes families just didn't know where, know where to go and needed the help in finding out where to go. But in other areas, especially some of the more rural areas, there's just limited services um, for children with autism and other developmental delays. And so there's long waiting lists and oftentimes very daunting paperwork and other needs that families sometimes need help navigating. And this is where the family navigators felt they did the most work. Respite care for the parents and um, other family members was also something that was discussed as being really important. School enrollment and advocacy, I mentioned that before, um, was a huge need, um, especially as children were starting school or transitioning into middle school or other types of schools. The IEP navigation is a really common issue and some navigators feel really limited in this area because they're not as up to date on all the educational laws, especially again those that are navigating several states. So this is where they are relying a lot on the school districts and um, autism or educational liaisons in the different school districts to really help work with parents here. Um, parents actually said that one of the things that they thought would be really helpful for them is some kind of flow chart or roadmap. Again, that kind of goal-oriented approach that when they sat down with the navigator, this was something that was created to really help them understand where they needed to go for what, um, what their basic, how to actually navigate the different places that they need to go, and what types of services they can get in different places. Um, they're oftentimes very confused by the amount of information given to them, and so a simple one-page overview that is developed specifically for them and their child is something that they would really appreciate. Most common need overall, I heard over and over, and this was something that from both parents, PIs, and navigators themselves is advocacy, really helping parents to become better advocates for their child and learning how to navigate the system is a key part of that but then also finding their voice to really feel that they can and should be um, an integral part of their child's care team. Um, and they were also, just to kind of clarify, they were, they were really careful to say that there's a difference between building advocacy and being an advocate. And they didn't necessarily want to be that advocate. And they did thought that might be crossing a line. Rather wanted to build the parent skills themselves to be um, better advocates for their child. So not necessarily being the advocate, but building those skills. And I think the next slide. So because this became such an interesting topic, I, I specifically asked during each of the focus groups, you know, what is, how do you know if a parent is empowered or has, has become a better advocate for their child? Um, what does that look like? Because that's something that there's not a real tangible thing you can touch on and say you're empowered. And these are four of the main things that came up. Um, when a parent is not afraid to ask questions, when the parent and family accepts the diagnosis, when a parent becomes a support for other parents, and when parents are able to share stories with other parents. And one of the navigators I, on here, it says Facebook page, one of the navigators spoke about how their site had started up a Facebook page um, for parents, and this is a place for parents to share stories um, in a virtual way, and they had, um, because it was virtual, it didn't require people to come and sit down and and talk and share stories in that face-to-face. -face. Um, they had several hundred people that had become a part of this Facebook page and were sharing stories. So these are the kind of things that parent, uh, family navigators are really looking for in determining whether they've been successful in making their, their clients a better advocate for their child and whether or not parents are empowered is, is these types of things. Okay. Um, Next slide. Okay, so we also asked about any challenges that um, navigators have had meeting family needs. One, I already mentioned this, is some of the cultural norms that may stigmatize or deny the ASD diagnosis. Um, we see that in many different communities. 
Um, again, also mentioned this before, the limited availability of services, especially in rural areas. Um, family lack of follow-through with services. So this is something that these are the parents that have yet to really be fully empowered and are advocates for their child. Um, and there's a number of reasons why families may not be following through with these services. It may be that they um, have not fully dealt with the diagnosis yet. Um, it may be that they have other family issues going on. They may have issues with their housing or with um, transportation or their job situation that just takes priority. Um, time being spread too thin. This is something that we heard from family navigators over and over again, that there's just not enough time to do everything that they would like to do for the families they're serving. Um, and then finally, I've also mentioned this a couple times, is um, serving families not only from different states, but different countries. Um, several sites have uh, international families that are visiting them, um, really looking for a diagnosis and access to services that may not be available to them in their home countries. So that's also um, the cultural competency as well as linguistic, as well as just historical competence um, comes into play here. Okay. Okay, next slide. Okay, so finally one of the things we asked is what are you tracking and evaluating with in relation to family navigation? We found there's very limited data collection and evaluation. Um, at most, um, sites are tracking the number of families served and maybe the referrals that are provided. Um, a couple sites are conducting a family intake or feedback questionnaire, and three sites are doing a satisfaction survey with parents that have accessed these services. Um, aside from that, um, there's not a lot of evaluation going on with the family navigation services. The PIs um, and family navigators as well identified some things that they thought would be important to look at, and those things include family functioning, family education, empowerment, and quality of life. These were all things they felt that their services were touching upon, but were not necessarily able to evaluate. Okay, so next slide. So just kind of briefly um, highlighting some of, um, some of these results. So we see a lot of variability in the types of navigation, including the people that are involved, as well as the referral and the families themselves that are provided. Um, the navigators themselves look very similar as far as their demographics and background, but the families that are being served are very diverse. Um, there's limited funds for these services, and so that really does seem to determine the structure that is being used at the sites. Some sites have sought outside funding for to support these services. Others are using ATN funds um, or to try to support um, staff that are part of the ATN with this as well. So there's a couple different models for funding that are being used. Um, families often require more ongoing case management services than the navigators can really provide. Um, how families are getting to them services differs a great deal. We found that training and cultural competence is probably the most common training need identified, and the tracking and evaluation is, is very limited. Um, so the outcomes that can be described as a result are therefore also limited. Next slide. Okay, so some of our next steps. Um, so right now, um, the work group that has been a part of this initial study is continuing in a slightly different form. Um, what I didn't mention at the beginning is we did not have any family navigators themselves in this initial work group. That was decided because they were going to be participants in the study. We wanted to um, make sure it was not contaminated. The study wasn't contaminated in that way. We are looking to diversify our work group at this juncture and include family navigators for the second stage. Um, and the second stage, really, uh, we don't want to change what's going on. Um, we recognize there's variability, and now we know what that looks like. Um, but we want to use the information um, that we've gathered to evaluate which model or models might emerge as the most successful to address the goal. 
Um, and the outcomes that we'll be looking at include empowerment and family stress. Um, again, empowerment and advocacy were certainly some of the things that came up um, most common. Um, also, potentially looking down the road, funding for family, family navigation services right now, um, we don't know if there are actual cost savings, but someone had mentioned that this might be something down the road we want to look at is uh, a cost-benefit analysis with these, with these services. Um, as far as our measure for empowerment, what we're looking at right now is the parent activation measure for developmental disabilities, which is already being utilized at the sites. It's a 13-item questionnaire, which most of you are probably familiar with, um, assessing parent knowledge, skills, confidence, um, and their confidence for self-management of their child. And then also administering um, the family assessment device to assess overall family functioning, so the two outcomes that we are looking at. We are also in the process of developing, developing a manuscript outlining the three types of family navigation services that we've identified. So that's a work in progress and kind of look, um, the mo looking at the primary models of services we're seeing. Okay, next. And that is it. Um, I guess we can open it up to questions now. So I have a couple questions and then if anyone else has additional questions, you can always type them into the questions bar and I can read them out. Um, so given what you've learned, what would be some of your top recommendations for a site or a clinic that wants to start the process of getting a family navigator on board and on staff? Hmm. Um, I would say really kind of taking a step back and looking at what the types of families that you're serving um, and what the common needs are. And that can help inform the type of person you bring on board, but also the work plan for that for that individual. I'd also, and that also speaks to some of the diversity. If you're working in a clinic setting that has um, a very diverse uh, patient base, thinking about what type of person you would want in that role that can navigate um, many different backgrounds. Um, I'd also look at uh, making sure that you have a very strong, um, a deep and wide roll of, virtual Rolodex. I don't think any of us have Rolodexes anymore, but kind of thinking about what your resources are in the community because families have so many different needs. Um, the navigator has to be really nimble and able to access a number of different needs, so kind of having those community resources at the ready is, is really important. So kind of along this, the lines of your answer to the previous question um, and some of the results that you presented upon, do you have any suggestions in terms of professional background or specific other specific skills um, for a family navigator? You know, I think um, from what I've learned, and I, I would um, invite others to jump in as well on this, it, it seems like the folks that are on the ground doing this work are the right people. Um, I think having the social work background, a nursing background, kind of that coming from a, a place of service provision is important. I do think the idea of a hybrid model where you are pairing a professional with a parent or um, a community health worker of some sort is an important one to consider because you have the best of both worlds there. You have someone that can bring the empathy and perspective to the family and also the professional lens to make sure that parents are getting what they need. So I, I, I think, this, as I said, there's pros and cons to both of those, but I, I do think that the folks that are currently in this job, are they're, they're very dedicated and they're the right folks. So another question, um, kind of LA area specific. If you know of any studies or work that's been done specifically with the Iranian American population in the area? Um, I do not. There is someone um, within, because I'm in LA, as you probably recognize, um, there is someone in our uh, clinic setting that is working um, with Arabic communities more generally, but not necessarily the Persian community. Um, 
certainly something to think about because there is a very large Persian population here. Um, and I'm wondering if there's um, how similar or different they might be from the, the larger Arabic community. And another question, um, what are some of the biggest successes that you saw or heard about um, while interviewing family navigators and parents and other folks within the network? Um, successes of the use of family navigators? Yeah, that's a question I posed to them almost exactly. It's like, tell me a success story. And what was funny, uh, funny is that, um, you know, most of the respondents were just like, kind of like, couldn't come up with a single story. I think they all kind of melted together in a way. Um, there were a couple stories that stick in my head, and one in particular is a, a family, and I can't remember where they were, um, but had been overwhelmed um, for a couple years really trying to get the right diagnosis for their child. They had been from place to place, um, kind of pushed around um, by different providers, and they they finally made it into one of the ATN sites, and the this parent had done a lot of homework. She was not someone who was necessarily just kind of naive to to what was going on. So she knew a lot about um, autism, and suspected that was what was going on with her child the whole time, but couldn't get anyone to verify that. So when she finally got the diagnosis, um, it was kind of interesting. The story was that you know it was almost um, that she became um, a navigator for other families in a way. So after working with the navigator in that site, she did become kind of one of those parents that they would send other people to. So she was so relieved and she was actually going into community settings and bringing families into the network um, to help them get the right diagnosis. So um, the family navigator kind of got her situated and then she immediately wanted to do something similar to give back to the community. And that to me, kind of is one of those stories that sticks out that a family was so relieved to finally get the help that they needed, um, they decided to take it on themselves. That's a, that's a great success story um, and kind of along the same lines. Any advice or suggestions for folks in the audience who might want to become family navigators themselves? Huh, that's interesting. Um, I would say, uh, you know, there's a number of different routes that, that, that could be taken with this, um, and it depending upon the background of the individual, um, if you do have a professional um, credential such as an MSW or RN, you know, it, it's a much easier road, I think. If you do not have that, I would look into working with um, different advocacy groups in your community. Um, looking at different support groups for parents in your community. I think those are excellent places to find parents that are probably in need and can, would appreciate assistance from someone that has gone through this and can provide an uh, empathetic ear and um, kind of the perspective of what's needed and the mindset that's needed to, to navigate all of this. Great advice. Um, we don't have, unless there are other questions that folks want to ask, um, that, those are all the questions that I have um, for the presenters. So unless there are other questions, then we can go ahead and wrap things up. And I don't have any other questions coming through, so <laughs> I will say just a final thank you so much for presenting. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, just a reminder that this session is eligible for CME credit. So after the session you'll receive a copy of the slides, a copy of the um, recording of the webinar, and also an evaluation form to complete for CME credit. And if you have any questions you can contact me. And Thank you so much for joining today. Yes, thank you.